all for joining us today for our live webinar, uh, which will be presented by Professor Michelle Lagarde entitled Fluxomics of Lipid Mediators and Oxylipins in Blood Compartments. My name is Valerie O'Donnell. I'm based at Cardiff University in the UK. The webinar is being recorded and it'll be uploaded onto the Lipid Maps YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, we've got about 45 minutes with 10 minutes afterwards to answer questions. And uh, one thing I need to stress at the start is that as you think of questions, put them in the chat then. Don't wait till the end, because if they're in the chat, when we get to the end, what I'll do is I'll ask you to unmute yourselves and you can ask your question yourself. You can have a direct conversation with, with Professor Lagarde, which is so much better than me reading out questions, and we'll take as many as we can. Um, registration for the next webinar, is for which is being hosted or presented by Dr. Stacey Wendell from University of Pittsburgh, is now live and open as well. And we're uh, very grateful for sponsorship by Cayman, uh, who's, who are um, sponsoring our uh, webinar today. So now I want to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Michelle Lagarde, who in many ways doesn't need an introduction. Um, I'm really excited to hear his seminar. I've followed his work for many years because he works in a very similar area for me. Um, and he is, Michelle Lagarde is University Professor Emeritus at INSEE Lyon, at Lyon University in France. He started his re research career at the Pasteur Institute of Lyon, localized in University Hospital, and then spent around 10 years as a researcher at INSERM, the French Medical Research Council, equivalent to the NIH, before having a university position to teach structural and metabolic biochemistry, pursuing his seminal research on lipids. Uh, his research interests re really relate with membrane lipids and lipid mediators that come from membrane lipids um, in the context of blood and vascular cells in response to activation and challenge, especially in the context of aging and diabetes. Uh, and again, like myself and also like Ed, who I can see is on the call as well, you know, we work mainly in the area of oxygenated derivatives of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is a, a really important, um, significant area re relevant for inflammation, uh, development, health and disease and uh, really important. So in, I think in recent years, he's had a, a big focus on DHA and its metabolites also in brain and inflammation. Um, and he's very well known for his rigorous structural analysis, I think, of oxygenation products of DHA, I would say, from, from my knowledge of, of, his, of much of his work. So after his PhD in biochemistry and his doctorate in sciences, he worked as a postdoc at the Department of Biochemistry at the Royal College of Surgeons in England in London, then following his doctor, doctorate in human bi biology, specializing in hematology and immunology, he undertook three short sabbaticals um, in the US, first at the University of Illinois, and then at the Department of Biochemistry at Michigan State University, and then at Biochemistry and Chemistry at UCSD, where he may indeed have run into and worked alongside Ed at some point. Um, I, it would be interesting to hear more about, about that. Um, he founded the Institute for Mus Multidisciplinary Biochemistry of Lipids, IMBL in Lyon, and was director of a functional lipidomics platform for 10 years. He's also been president of several scientific societies, including Gurley, ICBL, and ISFOL. Um, co-author of around 500 publications and also has published a really useful book for those who are new to the field called Structure, Structural and Mediator Lipidomics, A Functional View in 2016 and really, really good introduction to the field. And I know we're going to hear a lot about, about his work in the field today and I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm going to hand over to Professor um, Michelle Lagarde now. Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Valerie, for this kind introduction. Uh, as you know from on this first slide, you can see, of course, the title, and also I would like to underline different uh, colleagues with the name, bold names associated to my work. And I would like also to point out uh, that <clears throat> we work in this IMBL, which is underlined in the affiliation line. Uh, IMBL is, means uh, Institute for Multidisciplinary Biochemistry of Lipids, and IMBL uh, is uh, hosting at, at the moment uh, our lipidomics platform. So, as an introduction, I would like first to thank Ed Dennis, who is at the origin of Lipid Maps, which largely contributed in developing lipidomics approaches. So, lipidomics uh, is be becoming fashionable names, I would say. Until now, 8,000 papers have used the name of lipidomics compared to only one in 2002 by Charlie Sierra. Uh, it was the first uh, to, to, to use lipidomics and only nine in 2003, including 
an editorial in PBA by Fritz Spinner and I, which was entitled Lipidomics is Emerging. So, but why fluxolipidomics? This is relevant to the measurement of metabolically related lipids having different lifespans and diverse biological activities. Uh, fluxolipidomics intends to approach fluxes between uh, those metabolites. These measurements at various times should allow a better evaluation of functional lipids within a definite biological system. Of course, this requires a knowledge of the related metabolites and their biological functions on which this lecture will focus. Uh, I don't intend to speak too much about the analytical aspects, but mainly on uh, how, how, to, how to measure, not how, but the importance of measuring related metabolites which are appearing at different times. <clears throat> we may then consider that fluxolipidomics can especially be applied to targeted lipidomics. The first example I will show you concerns membrane phospholipids. I have chosen um, <clears throat> phosphoinositides, which, which are not the major phospholipids in membranes, but uh, they are quite functional. Phosphoinositides all derive from Phosphatidyl inositol, as you can see on the left. And uh, they are <clears throat> even more phosphorylated on the inositol moiety to produce PI4 phosphate, PI4, 5, P2, and PI3 phosphate. Their characteristic is to, is to have the sterile. Uh, at the SN1 position and arachidone oil at the SN2 position. So the most uh, important in, in terms of function, not in terms of quantity, is probably PIP2. So if we look at the metabolism of PIP2, it is mainly hydrolyzed by phospholipase C, especially phospholipase C gamma, to provide DAG, diacyl glycerol, and IP3. And IP3 is an important inducer of calcium release within the cells. DAG is also able to stimulate protein kinase, uh, yes, protein kinase C. But you know, measuring DAG is not very informative because it is rapidly hydrolyzed by DAG lipase into MAG, monoacyl glycerol, releasing the SN1 position, which is uh, steric acid. And uh, also, DAG can be easily phosphorylated by DAG kinase into phosphatidate, which is further cleaved by phospholipase A2 into uh, LPA, lysophosphatidic acid, which is quite active, especially through G proteins. So uh, to measure, to look at the activation of, of this pathway, it should be important to measure both DAG, MAG, PA, and LPA in function of time. However, uh, as you can see, all those molecules have a uh, characteristic for having steric acid at the SN1 position and arachidonic acid at the SN2 position. This is important to be considered because PA and LPA could be uh, produced from PC directly by hydrolysis through PLD and PLA2 and so on. But PC the, the, at the origin has many palmitic instead of steric at the SN1 position, and also several uh, diverse unsaturated fatty acids at the SN2 position. So it's very important to be careful about the fatty acid composition of those molecules to uh, appreciate, evaluate the activation of PIP. Uh, MAG is also easily by mag lipase in glycerol, which is not a lipid, of course. So in this pathway, you can see the release of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid will have its own behavior. So the second um, example I will take is the example of platelet activating factor. It's a specific phospholipid, which is able to aggregate platelet, uh, blood platelets, sorry, and it is also 
uh, very active to as a pro-inflammatory molecule. It's a bit uh, special molecule. It's a choline phospholipid, as you can see, with uh, an alkyl at the SN1 position instead of an acyl, and a short chain at the SN2 position, which is an acetyl. So PAF is generated from this precursor present in, in membranes. And this precursor is known to contain all only uh, arachidonic acid at the SN2 position. So uh, from this precursor, activation of cells by cleavage, by phospholipase A2, especially cyto cytosolic phospholipase A2, releasing arachidonic acid will give lysopath, lysopath, which is a precursor of PATH, and it will be acetylated by acetyl transferase using acetyl-CoA as an acetyl donor. So in order to measure generation of PATH, it's important to consider lysopathic PATH because, especially because PATH is labile enough and very easily hydrolyzed by PATH acetyl hydrolase, which is a secreted PLA2 associated to plasma lipoproteins, especially LDL. So its half-life is very short, which is classical for a very potent molecule. So it's important to measure both in terms of time, uh, in, sorry, in, uh, with, with different, at different times in order to have a good uh, idea of this activation. So as I said, arachidonic acid is released in that case. And in the last slide, I showed also the release of arachidonic acid. So it's time to say, more about uh, its oxygenation because uh, it will not be st staying like that for long. And I will take the example of arachidonic acid metabolism in blood platelets because uh, platelets are the model I, I know most. So in platelets, arachidonic acid is first and rapidly oxygenated by PGH synthase one, which is a constitutive isoform. And this PGH synthase has two activities, in fact, COX-1 cyclooxygenase and hydroperoxidase. So the first product is PGJ2 with an hydroperoxide at, at position uh, 15. But rapidly, PGJ2 is reduced into PGH2 by this hydroperoxidase. So it's impossible to measure PGJ2. PGH2 is also difficult to measure because of its instability here. And it is rapidly transformed by PG synthesis into prostaglandin D2, PG prostaglandin E2, which are biological active, and PGF2 alpha, which is much less active. And in platelets, and not in platelets, but in general, this instability of PGH2 leads to the cleavage products, MDA, using corresponding to this part malandaldehyde, which is also a good marker of lipid peroxidation, and the complement, which is a C17 fatty acid with the hydroxyl at the 12 uh, carbon, well, the initial carbon 15. But which is characteristic to platelets is to uh, have a thromboxane synthase. This enzyme has been described first in platelets because platelets are usually could be, could be, not usually, could be also called thrombocytes. And this uh, thromboxane synthase isomerizes PGH2 into thromboxane A2, which is even more unstable. You know, its life uh, time or lifespan has been evaluated to 30 seconds, 30 seconds only. So thromboxane A2 is very rapidly hydrolyzed into thromboxane B2, which can be measured as a, an indication of the, these metabolites, but within platelets only. The second pathway is called 12 lipoxygenase because it's a lipoxygenase which specifically uh, oxygenate carbon 12, leading to 12S hydroperoxide, which is efficiently reduced by glutathione peroxidase into 12HHET. But you know, this kind of metabolism has to be considered uh, within context of the cell and the environment. So if we look now at platelet activation, 
they could be activated by collagen, which is an important uh, component of a vessel, or thrombin, which is generated in plasma. And in response to this activation, uh, arachinic acid is metabolized into thromboxenate, which activates platelets, because it's a potent, I didn't say it yet, but thromboxenate is a very potent aggregating agent through specific receptors. And uh, of, of course, as I said, thromboxane A2 is degraded into thromboxane B2, as well as PGH2 is cleaved in HHC and uh, MDA. So measuring uh, thromboxane B2 and HHT could be a good indicator of the activation, but it's not enough because other molecules are produced, as I said, prostaglandins, and prostaglandin D2 is active on platelets. PGD2 is an inhibitor of blood platelet aggregation by increasing cyclic AMP, which is the same for PGE2, except when PGE2 is produced in low concentration. It's uh, in contrast, at low concentration, PGE2 decreases cyclic AMP, so potentiating platelet aggregation. As I said, uh, 12 lipoxygenase produces 12 h speed which is active by stimulating the release of arachidonic acid and also stimulating PGH synthase. So it's, it's an active uh, intermediate. Fortunately, GPX1 will reduce it into uh, 12 heat, which has not the same activity. Even 12 heat is able to antagonize a little bit the action of thromboxenate. However, in the context of the, uh, of the blood compartment, 12V can be, can be uh, used to be dehydrogenated into 12 oxo heat, which is a little bit active in terms of pro-inflammatory, um, is a sort of pro-inflammatory molecule, but not so active. It's a dehydrogenation. In general, prostaglandins are degraded by 15 dehydrogenase, which is uh, mainly present in uh, pulmonary, pulmonary vessels, producing 15 oxo derivatives, which are completely inactive. In contrast, PGD2 can be dehydrated into PGJ2, which is further dehydrated into 15D PGJ2, a very potent inducer, activator of uh, PPAR gamma. PGE2 can be also degraded by dehydration into PGA2 in acidic condition, or B2 in basic condition, but they are inactive. Also, thromboxin B2 outside of platelets can be dehydrated, dehydrated even dehydrothromboxin B2, which is stable, and even beta oxidized into dinor titranor thromboxin B2. And this beta oxidation is also occurring on prostaglandins. So it is clear that measuring only thromboxin B2 and HHT. Uh, in, in total bloods does not give enough uh, uh, information about the activation. It's important to consider the others and especially in function of time. So talking about the blood compartment, I have to tell you some other metabolism from in endothelium and white cells. In endothelium, for instance, PGH2 is mainly converted into prostacycline. Prostacycline is a very potent molecule to, to be active on as an inhibitor of platelet aggregation and also a vasodilator. So it's, uh, it's an opposite, opposite ac action compared to thromboxin A2. It is also uh, very labile. Its half-life is about uh, tw two minutes. It is and degraded into 6-oxo-PGF1-alpha, uh, also called 6-keto-PGF1-alpha, but it's better to say 6-oxo, it's not a keto, it's an oxo. And this uh, product is also beta-oxidized into dinor and titranor 6-oxo-PGF1-alpha. So measuring 6-oxo-PGF1-alpha, it's not enough. It's important to consider the others. Now, if we look at white cells, an important enzyme is 5 LOX, 5 lipoxygenase, which makes 5 uh, HPT 
which is further uh, reduced by glutathione peroxidase into 5-HEAT. Five 5-HEAT five is not active, but it could be dehydrogenated outside into 5-OXO-HEAT, which is very active as a pro-inflammatory molecule. So uh, specificity of 5 lox is to convert this hydroperoxide into an epoxide into leukotriene A4 called leukotrienes because it's a piece molecule uh, conjugated trienes described for the first time in leukocytes. So leukotriene A4 is further converted by what is called leukotriene B synthase, which is a, a specific hydrolysis of the epoxide leading to this uh, molecule LTB4, which is very active as a pro-inflammatory molecule. I must tell you because uh, more about this uh, structure of this molecule, because I will talk more on structures later on. This, this molecule is probably very active because of this conjugated triene, ZEE, cis trans trans. And LTB4 is further oxidized by cytochrome P450, making this 20 hydroxy LTB4, which is much less active, but still active compared to less LTB4. And it is further oxidized into 20 carboxide. It's not a, another carbon, you know, it's carbon 20, which is further oxidized. So it is called 20 carboxylic uh, derivatives of uh, LTB4, which is completely inactive. This is occurring in neutrophils, which is the most uh, important, uh, most abundant uh, white cells. But considering eosinophiles, it's another category of white cells. Glutathione peroxidase, I'm sorry, glutathione, this tripeptide uh, being gamma glutamate, cysteine, glycine with the thiol. At, uh, of glycine, which is quite active to open this epoxide, making this adduct LTC4, leukotriene C4. And this molecule is quite active as well as its product as uh, bronchoconstricting molecules. So LTC4 is transformed by uh, releasing gamma glutamate by glutamate transferase into LTD4 and both are active, as I said. And finally, the peptidase will release glycine, just maintaining cysteine on the molecule, and LTE4 is considered inactive, inactive. So those molecules are called peptidoleukotriones. Now it's important to continue looking at other metabolism. And several cells have 15 hypotysinase making 15 SHPT, which is further reduced in, into 15 heat by glutathione peroxidase. And uh, of also 15 heat is dehydrogenated into 15 oxo heat, which is a little bit active, but not so active as 5 oxo heat. But a characteristic of 15 hypotysinase is to make a second oxygenation carbon eight, making a triene, a conjugated triene with a, a configuration which is completely, not completely, but different to, to the LTB4. You remember LTB4 was ZEE, this one is EZE. So this difference make this molecule inactive in terms of as a proof inflammatory molecule, even uh, an inhibitor of homoxane. Of, I'm sorry, of leukotriene B4. And also cytochrome P450. There are several cytochrome P450. One of them is able to oxygenate directly or acid, making 20 heat. And others are able to make epoxides to each fatty, each double bonds. And the resulting molecules are trienoate instead of tetrienoate. And those different trienoates are hydrolyzed into dihydroxy derivatives. So we have a mul multiple metabolism of arachidonic acid, and even those molecules could be metabolized further. Now, if we consider the interaction between 
different cells, blood cells and vacuole cells, we can use this simply simple, uh, simple figure, which we published more than uh, 30 years ago <laughs> in a review. But as you can see, for instance, PGH2 produced within platelets can be exchanged and make transformed into prostacycline, which is quite active, as I said, through endothelium, and also with the collaboration of lymphocytes to make the same. Looking at the lipoxygenase product, end product, 12 heat, 12 heat can be also transformed by the five lipoxygenase of neutrophils to make what we call LTBX to differentiate it from LTB4. And the same, and the difference is the following. LTBX is EZE, while LTB4 is ZE. So as I said already, LTB4 is very, a very potent pro-inflammatory molecule, likely because of this configuration. And this geometry does not give the same activity on the molecule. And LTBX is even an antagonist of LTB4. So to, just to finish with this cooperation, we can see also that LTA4 produced in neutrophil could be transformed into LTC4 with a co collaboration with cooperation with platelets and also LTC4 with endothelium. Erythrocytes, which is very inactive, it does no oxygenase, is able to transform LTA4 into LTB4. And taking into account that erythrocytes are very numerous within the blood, it's not negligible. So uh, this collaboration could make, in function of time, various molecules. Now, I would like to say, to explain something specific for long chain omega-3 PUFA, which are fashionable at the moment in terms of uh, prevention of diseases, cardiovascular diseases, for instance, and so they are important uh, uh, proof of nutritional interest. The first one is eicosapentaenoic acid, which is a, a sort of analog of arachinoic acid with an additional double bond at the omega-3 position. So EPA is oxygenated like arachinoic acid, except for thromboxane A3 and B3, which are hardly produced. It seems that uh, thromboxane synthase prefer much prefer PGH2 to PGH3. More recently, Zolvins E have been described by Charlie Siran and his team. Uh, Resolvins, they have been called Resolvins because they accelerate the resolution of the inflammation. Another important long chain omega-3 PUFA is docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, with 22 carbon and six double bond, but at different position. And those different position prevent uh, this molecule, this fatty acid, to be a substrate of cyclooxygenase. But it's a good substrate of uh, lipoxygenase. For instance, five lipoxygenase in presence of glutathione peroxidase will give two different isomers at position, hydroxy derivative at position four and seven. It's the same for 12 lipoxygenase also in presence of glutathione peroxidase, releasing, giving 11 and 14 hydroxy derivatives. However, it has been described that uh, 12 lipoxygenase without uh, immediate effect of glutathione peroxidase leads to hydroperoxide, of course, and this hydroperoxide has some time to be into the epoxide, 13, 14 epoxide, which is further hydrolyzed into these derivatives, dihydroxide, called myrosine one by uh, Charlie Suran, because myrosine, because it has been described in macrophage. And you see again this conjugated triene, which is E, E, Z, which is the inverse of leukotriene B4, which is Z, E, E. So this uh, inversion could explain maybe it's speculation. Uh, the inhibition of myrosin 1 on pro-inflammatory activity of neutrophil B4. It's the same for 15 lipoxygenase 
if glutathione peroxidase is not present or, or, or deficient or decreased activity, the intermediate hydroperoxide can be transformed into epoxide, which is hydrolyzed by an epoxide uh, by epoxide hydrolyzed into the same kind of molecule, which has been called protecting D1. In contrast, in presence of active glutathione peroxidase, this 15 lipoxygenase leads immediately to 15 hydroxide instead of, uh, so the hydroperoxide uh, lifespan is, is shortened. And the second lipoxygenation activity makes this dihydroxide derivatives that we call PDX to differentiate it from PD1. And the main difference in terms of structure, but also activity is the EZE trans cis trans of the conju conjugated triene. And this is quite important because PDX is not uh, very active as an anti, uh, as an anti inflammatory molecule, but it's an active molecule to inhibit platelet aggregation. Uh, it has been also described as a useful molecule in obesity recently, and even to inhibit the proliferation of uh, influenza, influenza virus. And finally, uh, DHA can be transformed into resolvins D, which are also able to induce, to promote the resolution of inflammation. In addition to EPA and DHA, another uh, long chain fatty acid, which is not very common, is EPA and 3. And DPN3 is likely to be is likely to be lipoxygenated, but nothing is known about it. I didn't say anything about uh, the most important, probably omega-3 fatty acid, but it's not a long chain; is an uh, important molecule uh, to for for nutrition, alpha linolenic acid, and I will say a few words about it later on. So, because I spent some time talking about marazine, PD-1, and PDX, I would like to show a little bit more uh, those structures. And first, PD-1 has been described, as I said, by through the 15 hypoxygenation, but with an epoxide intermediate, and then uh, hydrolysis with the epoxide hydrolase, giving this structure which is probably quite uh, crucial for the activity, anti-inflammatory activity of PD-1. This is not the case for PDX, PDX because it results from a double hypoxygenation, hypoxygenation at both position 17 and 10, and resulting with this uh, um, conjugation, conjugated triene, which has completely different activities. And Marazin is close to PD-1. But uh, from through 12 lipoxygenase instead of 15. A few words about resolvins. I uh, don't want to spend too much time about resolvins because it's a bit complicated. But resolvins uh, are, uh, resolvins E are produced by COX2 after uh, inhibition by aspirin. You know, aspirin is able to inhibit COX2 as a prostaglandin generator by acetylating the active site. But still, after acetylation, COX2 is still able to uh, oxygenate the product and at the 18 position. So you can see this uh, with 18R hydroperoxide derivative. And this product can be further uh, transformed by 5 lox as I described for arachidinic acid. And this product is further reduced by glutathione peroxidase and, and transformed in epoxide by five blocks again. And leukotriene B4, B synthase into resolving E1. So resolving E1 is a trihydroxy derivative. Instead, when glutathione peroxidase is directly acting on the hydroperoxide, we give it, it gives uh, dihydroxy derivative resolving E2 and resolving E3 by uh, epoxidation and hydrolysis. 
dealing with GJ, uh, it's even more complicated, but uh, the intermediate is the 12, the uh, 17 hydroperoxy derivative, which is further reduced and transformed by five locks into this molecule. And epoxide through LTB4, LTB synthetic D2, or by epoxidation and hydrolysis into resolving D1. And further, uh, hydroxylation by five lots. Here it was in at position seven, here at position four, and glutathione peroxidase and so on, giving resolvins D3. I must tell you that uh, in addition to those resolvins which are all active, several other resolvins have been recently described. Uh, I thought I said some I showed you some co cooperation between aspirin treated COX2 and LOX for um, uh, resolving E formation. It's also occurring for DHA. DHA in, in presence of COX2 modified, uh, inhibited by aspirin, could produce 17 RHOD. 70 R hydroxy derivative instead of 17 um, uh, S. And this is after secondly uh, oxidation, second oxidation, producing this isomer of PDX called sometimes uh, aspirin treated, which is a bit uh, exaggerated. But so uh, AT PDX has the same configuration as PDX in terms of double bonds. But uh, it's SR compared to the SS for PDX. And we can have the same from uh, alpha linolenic acid, which is transformed into 9R hydroxide and further lipoxygenated by 15 lipoxygenase to make 9R16S with again EZE. -E. We called it liquid. Lin sorry, linotrin 2 to differentiate it from linotrin 1, which is the SS. For uh, unknown reasons, the SR from ALA or SR from DHA are even more active, more inhibitory uh, for in terms of inhibition of platelet aggregation than the SS. We don't know why, but it's a probably interesting in terms of uh, aspirin effect. Anyway, uh, what about the further metabolism of those different protectins, marazin, uh, resolvins? We don't know, it has never been described, but it's, it's, it's likely that uh, they could be beta oxidized into dino derivatives. Uh, maybe not tetranol because of the first double bond at position four. And they are probably also oxidized, further oxidized by different cytochrome P450. Uh, what about long chain omega-6 PUFA? I have to, to say a few things about that. In addition to arachidonic acid, two omega-3, uh, omega-6, sorry, long chain PUFA are relatively common. The most common is adrenic acid. Adrenic acid has been called like that because that it has been first described in adrenal cells, but we know now it is present also in, uh, in kidney. And so uh, this molecule can be transformed by coxis one and two into diomo prostaglandins, but never, we don't know, don't know anything about its uh, the further metabolism, especially into dinor and, and tetranol derivatives. The other one is DPN6, which is quite rare, I would say, because it's a sort of a marker of DHA deficiency. It is not very much accumulating in the absence of DHA. Anyway, uh, it is present in some conditions and it's metabolism, oxygenation, oxygenated metabolism has never been described. But it is clear that lipoxygenase products are expected from both 22.4 and 22.5 and 6. So we could expect metabolism of those different oxygenated products. As a first summary, I would say, 
omega hydroxylation through cytochrome P450 may be expected from for all of them. Dehydrogenation of the various hydroxyl groups may also be expected. And also beta oxidation into dinor and even tetranor derivatives may be expected as well. So it is clear that looking at the, those different metabolites, uh, we could expect different products. And if we want to look at the global overall metabolism, it's important to measure different, those different metabolites in function of time. I would like to finish talking a little bit about endocannabinoids because they are derivatives of, of arachidonic acid and, and also I will take the, the example of DHA. Arachidonic acid is, is a precursor of anandamide. Uh, anandamide is arachidonide ethanolamide, while uh, DHA leads to synaptamide, which is docosahexaenoin ethanolamide. Anandamide is, is a molecule having some endocannabinoid activity like, like serotonin, uh, I'm not an expert on that. Like in contrast, synaptamide is, a, is very well known to, to stimulate uh, the synapses uh, formation. So the formation of those molecules is a bit special. For instance, anandamide is produced from uh, arachidonyl containing PC by transferring arachidonyl to the color head of PE. And it has been even said that arachidonyl has to be at the SN1 position, which is a bit strange, but anyway. So a specific acyl transferase is doing that, making this adduct. And this adduct is further cleaved by a phospholipase D activity, which is not a classical phospholipase D. And the cleavage releases arachidonyl ethanolamide. Anandamide. And we could do we could say about the same for um, synaptamide, although it has been clearly showed by E. Young Kim uh, in NIH that uh, synaptamide can be produced directly from free DHA, uh, making an adduct on the PE and after the release by PLD. But which is important to consider in terms of fixolipidomics is that anandamide is also uh, oxidized into prostamides and uh, into bilap oxygenases in hydroperoxides, which are further reduced into hydroxides. So measuring anandamide uh, could be a little bit, uh, uh, it's not enough you know, because anandamide is, has also its own metabolism. It is not known whether anandamide is further oxidized by cytochrome P450, but there is no reason why it could not. When dealing with synaptamide, we don't know anything about that. It's lipoxygenation, lipoxygenation and also oxidation at the omega position, but it, it's rather, it is likely. So finally, as a conclusion, I would say that bioactive phospholipids and especially PUFA of nutrition values are metabolized according to many different pathways. PUFA are oxygenated through various routes with obvious different kinetics. I showed several examples of that. These metabolic pathways are particularly relevant in the blood compartment because several cell types are physically interacting. And those cells may cooperate in the oxygenated PUFA metabolism. The different biological properties of those metabolites lead to different phenotypes in function of time, which totally justifies a fluxolipidomics approach for their measurement. This could especially concern mediator lipidomics. I would like just to quote at the end and uh, that especially issue in BBA molecular cell lipids uh, has been uh, dedicated to oxygenated metabolism of PUFA and also the analysis of the uh, metabolites. And it is not a very recent, but uh, quite re reasonably recent uh, special issue. And also the same year in 2015, we published uh, uh, a 
review in progress in lipid research entitled functional lipids and also look uh, pointing out uh, some pointing out some analytical uh, uh, systems. I would like to finish by acknowledging again my colleagues, which are very active in the functional lipidomics platform in Lyon, and some other people like uh, Thierry Durand in Montpellier, who is an uh, active chemist for making uh, standard lipids, standard oxygenated derivatives, and several other IMBL associated laboratories. Anna Nicolaou uh, have all have taught with, talk with her very, very often, and we, she was very helpful to make the special issue on BBA cited in the last slide. And Ion King for her collaboration in the synaptamide, synaptamide production. And I thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to ask questions, to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was great. Um, we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to start. And I've got a question about the, it was a biochem J paper, I think, where you published that 12 HP can activate cyclooxygenase in platelets. So um, I'm interested to know if you worked out the mechanism of that. I mean, I guess it could act as a peroxidase substrate, but you know, what, what do you think is going on uh, biologically? Uh, it seems it, it's a, a, a stress oxidant effect, in fact. Uh, we know that those lipoxygenase are more active in there is a, an oxidative stress and the, the relative accumulation of 12 HPTE could contribute, not could, yeah. but contributes in the oxidative stress. Oh, yes. I think there's some, some integrins that are sensitive to oxidation on the outside of platelets that may be involved. Maybe there's something like this, but I thought that was really interesting. Okay, so um, we've got a couple of questions. So Ali Hajaya, I need, hang on, I need to uh, get the participants list up and then um, I'm going to... Mute, un, okay, Ali, you can unmute yourself. You should be able to do that now and ask your question. Ali, we can't hear you. Do, do you ask me to read? I can. No. Well, no, no. Ali, can we? Can you speak, Ali? If you can't, we'll un read your question out. Ah, uh, there's something wrong with his microphone. Usually, he talks fine. So he wants to know: Are doubly and triply oxygenated mediators soluble in water? Um, sorry to say it again. Double oxygenation is what? Now, are double and triple oxygenated mediators mm. soluble in water? Ah, um, that's an interesting question. You know, if you consider uh, resolvins D, for instance, they are trihydroxide, trihydroxylated derivatives with a carboxyl and the different uh, double bonds, remaining double bonds, which which contributes to the polarity of the molecule. Uh, I would say it depends on the concentration. Mm. If, if they are active at, uh, at nanomolar concentration as, as uh, stated sometimes, it could be possible that at nanomolar they, they could be soluble in, in water. Mm. Yeah, possibly. Okay, thank you, Ali. So, Thierry Durand, I've given you permission to unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, okay. Hi, um, Valérie. Hi, Michel. Um, Hello, Thierry. <laughs> okay. um, you mentioned in uh, your slide uh, 18 that uh, PD-1 is not, or it doesn't know if it's some beta oxidation product, but uh, we published the papers and uh, you know that. Yes, you're right. you're right. You're right, you're right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. I, I, I've read your paper, I've read your paper, you described the beta oxidation of PDX1. Yeah. Of, of PDX1. Well, it exists. Yes, you're right. And Thank uh, you for, for the and, comment. Yeah, and, and uh, others is just a common, and uh, is a uh, fluxolipidomics just detect enzymatic metabolite and non-enzymatic uh, non oxygenated metabolite? No, there is no, no reason for not detecting the others. Uh, but uh, usually uh, enzymes are so active to, to modify mo the different products. You know, it's a matter of kinetics. 
if you consider the oxygenation of um, DHA, for instance, in neuroprostein or, or arachidonic acid in isoprostein, it's relatively uh, slow. It's not very slow, but much slower than uh, modification by lipoxygenesis or, or cyclooxygenase. So fluxolipidomics could be could be used for neuroprostains, for instance. I, I, I know you, you like neuroprostains, but <laughs> there is no reason for those neuroprostains to be, to be uh, not, not uh, dehydrogenated or be oxidized or oxidized in uh, uh, at the carbon, at the 20, on the omega carbon. There is no reason for that. So fluxolipidomics can be applied to them, no problem. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Ed, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, Dennis? Okay, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, great talk, Michelle. Uh, Hello. And, uh, especially in, enjoyed how much you talked about what happens in individual cells and then the intercell communication uh, with, uh, with multiple cells. I have two questions. The first is regarding 20 COCH or COOH. You were talking about LTB4 20 COCH uh, being a uh, oxidation product, but it didn't have a function. And um, and there and one also sees often arachidonic acid getting oxidized at the 20 position to make a 20 COCH. Uh, That's right acid. Uh, and so the question I have is, we've always thought that oxidation is a degradative pro process. And it's the way cells get rid of these molecules is by oxidation. On the other hand, there's so many examples of specific oxidation to make specific potent hormones and other products. Uh, do you think the 20 oxidation, which is more general than just the, the LTB4, uh, is just an oxidation or there are some specific 20 Coke metabolites that are functional? I don't know. I, I, I never, I never seen, a, I've never seen any paper describing this kind of uh, oxidation, but I don't know why it does, it's, it's not, it would not occur. <laughs> and if it's a, uh, the real thing, you know, we could expect that uh, those different molecules could be oxidized into 20 carboxyl or, or, or 22 carboxy. And uh, going back to the, the first question I had about, not first, but the one question I had before about uh, water solubility of molecules, of molecules. If you can easily imagine that uh, a double carboxylic, carboxylic acid would be much more uh, soluble because, you know, at uh, physiological pH, which is around seven, those carboxyl will be, will be carboxylate. There will be carboxylate carboxylate, uh, sodium carboxylate or potassium carboxylate, depending on, on the location. So those molecules will be, will, will disappear from the scope. <laughs> so, so, so that would explain their lack of functionality in a way, but just byproducts, because they do get made, but they would, they would uh, leave the site of logical action. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I took the example of LTB4 but because it has been described quite well with the 20 hydroxy being uh, still active, but much less than LTB4 and the 20 carboxyl, carboxyl derivative being completely devoid of activity. But I don't know, I don't see why it could not be applied to, to the others, frankly. Okay. Could I ask a second question? Yeah, At the go ahead. very beginning, you were talking about uh, the specificity of the PIPs, and I was in- of, of what, sorry, of what? A, a PIP, and the- Oh, yes. 
phosphonositide and the yeah. phosphates. And the fact that it always is rich in stearic acid in the one position and arachidonic in the two position. And my question is, uh, and you pointed out how uh, normally uh, we think of palmitic acid as being prominent in the one position. Where does the selectivity come in in the biosynthesis or remodeling of PIPs that all of a sudden we're used to SN2 remodeling, not so much SN1? And how, how does, where is the selectivity exerted for having PIPs end up with, with steric instead of arachidonic, uh, uh, palmitic in the one position? Yes, I, I underline these uh, properties of PIPs, of, of phosphoinositides to have mainly, mainly not exclusively, <laughs> steroyl at the SN1 position and arachidonyl at the SN2 position. Because it was, it, I underlined that just to differentiate the product, DAG and, and MAG, from and PA, from the, those molecules produced from PC, where we have other fatty acids. So it's a way to differentiate them. But your question uh, reminds me something we, we have obtained uh, using DHA uh, in vitro with platelets. When we enrich platelets with DHA in vitro, we found a, a small amount of DHA in, in, in PI, hmm. but very small. So it means that the arachidonic acid could not be ex uh, the exclusive uh, acyl at the SN2 position of, of phosphoinositides. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ed. Okay, so I have one final question before we end, Michelle. I, LTBX, I was interested in this, this lipid that then comes from neutrophils and platelets. What kind of systems has it been measured in? Has it been measured in vivo, in cell culture systems, or just with purified enzymes? Or Yeah, uh, it is easily to, to produce the ex vi uh, in vitro. Uh, if we, if we co-incubate platelets and, and neutrophils, uh, in presence of exogenous arachidonic acid, we can isolate LTBX oh, okay. in addition to LTB4. And they are, it is easily separable from LTB4 just by HPLC. And of course, HPLC coupled with GC, it's yeah. no problem. Yeah. Do you have to give exogenous arachidonate or will neutrophils make enough? No, this, this kind of cooperation has been, has been described by uh, Canadian scientist a long time ago, Pierre Borja. Ah, okay. Pierre Borja described yes. this, this kind of formation. Uh, I don't remember if it was uh, in vitro, but probably. Yeah, go uh, look at that. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thank you. Don't the detail. Uh, okay, right. Well, I think um, we've come to the end now. And uh, thank okay. you very much. That was that was really, yeah. really informative. And it's a pleasure. Great talk. So, hope. yeah, it was lovely to see you again. So, I'm um, going to say goodbye, and I think uh, we, Caroline will end the recording. Okay. So thank, thank you very much, and thank thanks you for, everybody for okay. coming. Bye-bye.